Bauman, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. Happy How are you today? I'm doing great. Really, thanks for inviting me now. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think that the listeners here are going to adore you as much as I did. You are a delight to speak with. I love the sound of your voice, but even more so, I love your story. I love what you do. And I love the things that you share. So let's just get right into it, shall we? Okay, well, I'll just start with who I am. So like you said, I'm B. Bauman. I'm a communication trainer, a humorist, a writer. And I have been living in outside of Heidelberg, Germany for the past 15 years. I have three children and I do stand-up comedy. That's who I am in a nutshell. Now, in your comedy, is that outside of your two children or is it <laughs> include them? Because I know my son, I feel like I do stand up comedy all the time, but it goes largely and wholly, I would say, unappreciated by yeah. my. Oh, that's funny. Okay. So you're doing, you're doing family jokes. No, actually, my two children aren't part of my material. And they live in Rhode Island. So I'm doing stand up on the road between, um, within Germany and the UK area. Oh, that sounds like a blast. And now just to clarify, I feel like that when I speak to them, I am hilarious, but they don't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Children don't find you funny. That, that's what I hear. That's what seems to be a generalization that works that so your children just uh yeah across the board do not think you are funny <laughs> at all mm -hmm. you know especially when you're trying to make a joke you know now if you're trying to be serious or if you're trying to have some decorum then they think you're hilarious right absolutely frustrating but <laughs> anyway you have a larger story to share also so tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to the place where you are right now. Yes, how I got here is a long story, but the shortest version is when I was a baby. So I'll start there. <laughs> uh, I okay. oh, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the doctors all looked at me and smiled. Unfortunately, my mother had a nervous breakdown and it's part of... Uh, a legend that she sort of had a nervous breakdown in the hospital. And so I immediately went into foster care and I didn't reunite with my mother until I was 13. And I think that started me on a journey of not fitting in. That's why I start there, because I think that was sort of the um, fulcrum that started me feeling like I was outside of every relationship. And then I, I managed to be an emancipated uh, adult at 16. And then when I, um, I met my husband, my first husband in Colorado Springs, where I was living with my family, my mother, or without my mother, I'm sorry, I was living alone. But I was living in Colorado Springs and I met my first husband and then he took me to Germany the first time. And um, I loved it in Germany. I really felt a connection. Unfortunately, we divorced and he helped me with the children because I wanted to go back to university. So he, my first husband did, the father of the children helped me with them. And I went back to university to get an English degree. And after I did that, I, of course, supported him and decided that I would move to Boston to be closer to my husband's, my ex-husband's family and the kids. And so, you know, we were able to have custody of the kids between us and that has always worked. 
And yeah. And then I was in college in New Mexico. That's where I went to college as a um, older, uh, what they call non-traditional student. And I had wanted to go to Mexico to write. Like that was my big dream. But I, of course, knew I had to support two kids. And I, and so when I moved to Boston, I became an assistant and then an executive assistant. And yeah. And the one thing I'm leaving out is I came to Heidelberg, Germany with the National Guard because I joined the National Guard in college. And so this is the point that everyone should remember. Here's the red thread. Because of that, when I was in a small jazz bar here in Boston and I heard my current husband speaking German, I said, oh, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. And as they say, the rest is history. Well, wow. that part of it. <laughs> now, I too served in the National Guard in <laughs> Illinois. I was a helicopter mechanic. Oh, cool. What I always wanted to be was a mechanic, but I honestly did not follow my passion. What did you do? Yeah, I think I was part of this generation that had a, a total Cinderella syndrome. So I just knew I was waiting on a prince and I was in homemaking classes, like I had homemaking classes. And so I really had that, um, pers I didn't have any perspective greater than uh, a black woman, perhaps as a nurse, like at the top of the uh, um, pay scale. And, and so I, yeah, so I just abandoned myself as a, uh, as a mother and as a wife. And so it was a long time for me to break out of that shell uh, and to find myself. In fact, I, I kept hiding. I kept hiding, you know, in my marriage and um, in my home even physically because I, for some reason, didn't feel like I was enough, that I, sh that I had a voice that I should be sharing. And so... That was a part of my journey is learning that. Um, but, but I loved, um, being, being in the National Guard. And that's what made me speak to my second husband when I was out. You know, you've hit on a lot of different things. And one thing I would like to highlight here, and it matters so much, uh, to the point where many of us overlook it and others never notice it. But our context and the framework from which we come matters so much. As a woman, I was given limits. I had a different perspective based on the fact that I was a woman. And you mentioned you were a Black woman. And that adds another layer. Our generations add another layer. So how do you package all of that? Not only in your comedy, but in your books and when you relate to others and teach others, how do you layer that into, into your thoughts? Well, I speak about myself and the people I speak to as non-traditional midlife beginners, midlife beginners, because I feel like there's a generation, like you said, there's a generation of us who didn't get the memo that we could be more. Like we weren't told that there was sort of um, all of this potential that we had, especially coming from my demographic, which was a poor inner city child in Indiana. And so I try to share that in my comedy that I was this, you know, poor inner city kid. And yeah, it was rough. And so it, it, kind of seems like a fairy tale that I'm wearing them now. Um, but it also came with this understanding that I knew I had something inside. And I think a lot of people do. It's like, I had something inside that I need to share that I, I want to give to others. And we're just looking for like, how do I do that? And that's why I wrote my book, Girl, You Ain't Crazy, because also, on top of my childhood, um, my non-traditional childhood, I was uh, labeled with uh, mental illness, like I went through cycles there. And once I 
read about non-divergent thinkers, excuse me, neurodivergent thinkers, that really helped me. This idea that, um, you know, I mean, the planet is neurodiverse, but there's people, people with autism, people with um, depression and other um, mental, struggling with other mental challenges who are neurodivergent. And how do we bring ourselves forward so that we're part of the conversation as we are? Not trying to be something different or hide it, but saying, I have these challenges, but I also deserve to be at the table. And so that's why I wrote the book, Girl, You Ain't Crazy, um, to, to try to have um, a humorous self-help book um, that says, you know, don't fire the help and you are your help. So don't give up on you. And not only are those voices needed at the table or welcomed at the table, they are desperately needed at the table. Because when one predominant voice is the only one that is given any sway, we lose so much. I have a biology background. My first <laughs> go around in the world was my degree in biology. And one of the fundamental core principles of biology is the importance of diversity. If there is going to be life and if life is going to survive any obstacles and hardships, a diversity is necessary, beyond necessary. It's a requirement or else it's going to be a short-lived endeavor to have neurodiverse voices, to have diverse people behind those voices is, what's the word I'm looking for? I speak crucial, for crucial, 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 necessary. Uh, to our survival and to getting through. And I think we've seen in COVID that we need in people, you know, the pandemic taught us that when we got to rethink systems and structures, we need those people who can think differently and consider things from a different perspective, because that's where some great ideas come from. Exactly. And, and like you say, we've known this, this idea that, that even nature is always um, looking creatively adapt and adaptability is is the key to being um, on this planet another thousand years and part of adapting like you just said is this idea that we have to have diverse thinkers in all aspects of life um, because also the idea that we are we're living on ourselves. I believe it was um, Albert Einstein who said, you know what, the thinking that got us here won't get us there. Now, I'm not sure what Albert Einstein, but someone said, yeah, <laughs> the thinking that got us here won't get us there. Mm -hmm. We have to grow into new thinking to solve a problem we've never solved before. Exactly. And exactly. And that's why we need creativity. And that's why I teach comedy. That's why I teach stand up because I, want people to realize, you know, that we, um, we need the ability to think we're, we always talking about think outside of the box, but if we're not really actively trying to think outside the box and look at things, then that adds a thing. And we're not actually looking outside the box. We're just in our cubicles or now, you know, in our homes. But like you said, I think what the one thing that COVID taught us was it doesn't matter when something comes we we adapt when we have to adapt we do but we get so comfortable that we just it's so easy to get into a routine so breaking that routine is something that you learn with comedy and so that's why I teach comedy and the funniest people in my opinion take my opinion for what it's worth but the funniest people see the same things I see, but have that other perspective that I overlook or that I miss that really brings out the funny. Yeah, and it's really, I mean, there's different types of comedians and there's different kinds of humor, like a George Carlin, the way he was able to really like bring the political, social political topics in a Jerry Seinfeld. Who was able to really 
look at society and the little things that we do that are so idiosyncratic and um and um crazy actually it's just crazy that we we're so routinized or culturalized to do what are a couple of lessons that you would love everyone to know through learning comedy why should we all enroll in a course about it mm -hmm. well comedy is great for teaching you small talk it's great for increasing your presentation skills and getting you out of your comfort zone because nothing great is going to happen inside your comfort zone because only thing that's in there is the things you know you know and so once you are able to break that and at first it feels really like oh uncomfortable but once you get used to it it gets bigger your area of comfort and then you're in your area of growth and that's what comedy classes can help us do is be in that growth space which will help us with relationships help us with work will help us get uh positions that we want to get help us lead teams and lead companies it just really is a foundational idea because laughter is a prime a, a primal primal um instinct that we have like even kids babies that cannot hear or see not it's just part of our inner makeup and so, and when we do laugh or cause others to smile, I mean, it doesn't have to be to tell a joke, but just to share a light moment and we cause others to smile, we immediately create a bond of trust. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like cold for trust when you can smile with someone else. And, and so that's also a great thing that comedy gives us this ability to create Barnes with them. And I heard you say that pursuing uncomfortable is one of the most important things we can do. Exactly. Exactly. Because that is where the pot of gold is. That is where the learning is. It's outside of your comfort zone because, and not out so far that you're traumatized, but out where you can say, I'm going to try this and it might not work out. And you might flop, you might bomb, but you won't die. And that's the thing. Once you see that you will survive and that it's all okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, death rate among comedians on stage, I think, is pretty minimal in our society. Right. Them. <laughs> and, and, but everybody knows the statistic that people are like, would rather be in the casket than giving the speech. You know, people are terrified of speaking in public. And, and I, I get it because usually when a bunch of eyes are staring at you, you're like the meal. You're, and you're actually about to become the meal. And so I think that's why the primal brain, which is still embedded in there, that primal brain that we put everything we can on top of, but that primal brain is still there. And it still is like, um, I'm going to save you at all costs, you know? So, and you have to be able to, yeah, say you are not in danger here. <laughs> you know, calm down, primal brain. You are not in danger. <laughs> yeah, get out of that fight or flight. Yeah. Yes. Reconnect with that thinking part of your brain. Yeah, uh -huh. And girl, give me a microphone and a room full of people. I am good to go. Yeah, yeah. good, good. Yeah, and just have fun uh, because there's so much in life that is honestly. I'm trying to think of what in, that isn't that you can't make fun of that you can't just simply try to to live with because. We're here for such a short time and we're on this blue dot spinning in space. So really anything is possible. You have to let it go a little bit 
go take yourself too seriously. For sure. You know, and there's such, uh, you know, people think, um, you know, I'm a spiritual leader. I'm a pastor. And people think you have to be very serious to be a pastor. And when I was called into this crazy business, so let's just say I was happy being a biologist. Fine and dandy being a biologist. <laughs> and then I felt a calling to something else. I was mad. I was not happy with it. And it took some time to reconcile that. And there was a conversation where I was having with who I call God. Some people call spirit, higher power, what have you. He was said, listen, you know my lack of filter. You know I'm going to say something ridiculous. I can't change who I am. This is just who I am. And frankly, you and I get along well because I am who I am because you are who you are and you made me this. Mm -hmm. And God's like, shh, shh. That is who I want. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's yeah. so beautiful now. And, mm -hmm. you know, we are who we are. And I think breathing is praying. And when we laugh, we do a lot of breathing. It's just a fifth, 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 fifth. You can't it's a great way. When you're laughing, when you're laughing, your body refreshes itself. And get this, I read, this is legit. It was on the internet. It has to be true. Okay. That laughing for 30 minutes is just as good as cycling for 30 minutes. Nobody fact check it. If you do, I don't want to hear any negativity. Don't ask. <laughs> what no, that's the fact I choose to live by. So laugh it up. And enjoy this life, cleanse your soul, and have a better time. You know, if you hate snow in the winter, and we get a lot of snow where I live, <laughs> if you're mad about it or whether you're happy about it, you get the same amount of snow, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it's the same thing with age. Sometimes we get bothered by age, but regardless of how old you are, you're going to be that old. Regardless if you return to school, start a business, you know, open a daycare, whatever you want to do, there's now is always the right time. You know, just start, you know, like, like I said, uh, I love midlife beginners. And I think, uh, like you said, being able to um, be in yourself and be in your, your spirit. And let that flow, let people see that, let that come out. Like you said, that is, let that shine. And when you let that light shine, like they say, once you let that light shine, then yeah, uh, spirit is, is, is a wonderful thing to see in everyone, every. Thank you. It, you know, I really admire people who can accomplish great things in their 20s and early 30s. I needed that time to figure out who I was not and what I was terrible at. <laughs> I am a person who can do things in midlife. There's a different understanding and a different perspective that comes once you hit 50 or thereabouts. And uh, that isn't available to you earlier on. So kudos to those who can do all those things earlier on. But for all of you who are listening who are past that earlier on space in life. There's so much goodness. Every okay. day. Now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm just sitting here trying to think of the actor who, who played in Driving Miss Daisy. Um, uh, Jessica Tandy and Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Yes. Morgan Freeman, I think, didn't get discovered and that's after years of course of, of working to be discovered until he was in his late 50s i believe and so yeah and oh my goodness look, look at me just i'm quizzing you this is the teacher i think it was um do it um the the woman who did the quilt Ma mother moser yeah. moses yeah, Mother Moses, I think. She didn't start until 60s or 70s. So it's, you have something in you. And whenever you bring it out, oh my goodness, it's amazing to all of us whenever it comes out. Like you say, if it comes out in a 10-year-old, 
or it comes out in a 99 year old. It's amazing. You know, and it's funny that you said Morgan Freeman, because I don't know if this was a regional TV program or what, but I grew up in central Illinois and we watched the electric company. It came on after Sesame Street and Morgan Freeman was on the electric company. I had them all through the 70s and in my childhood growing up, there was Morgan Freeman. And I did not know that. Okay. Say he was funny. He was a lot of things, but he's been a fixture. He's back right. there. He's been there, but uh, I think uh, yeah, he won was, his Academy Award mm-hmm. here. He was not the Morgan Freeman then that we know and adore now. Exactly. But. Yeah, but no, that's great that he was there. That's what I'm saying. He was he was there, and in all these years, all these iterations of his life has brought him to where he is now. Mm-hmm. And that's all. And that's all our backstory is meant to do is to be the building blocks that we use to get ourselves even further ahead. Yeah. And without the then, he probably wouldn't have the now. Exactly. I really believe that. Yeah, you you have to, all of what made you you, like you said, there you were doing biology in that world and something sparked something else in you that grew and in grew you into who you are today. And and you're, of course, still growing. We're all still growing. And that's what I think is so amazing is is potential. It is. The, you know, I was thinking back your story, 13 years in foster care to begin your life Mm -hmm. and living in many different places, New Mexico, Colorado Springs, Boston, Germany, all of these places, you know, through all of your story, I keep getting a sense of unrootedness. And a lot, a lot of people wouldn't be able to bloom whether they're planted after experiencing so much unrootedness. But it seems like you have used that to plant roots wherever you are. In here. Oh, and oh, what I what I've learned, Mel, what I think I've learned is, um, you know, there's this song that says, I've got no root. Um, I've got no root. <laughs> you know, it's just this idea that you never had roots. You were always just um, part of the, uh, part of the atmosphere, part of the air, part of the people that are around you, you know, and I know people who are rooted, who are very rooted and, and yeah, trees grow with the, those deep kinds of roots and that's beautiful. But also the flowers that only, um, last the day or the flowers that throw their seeds up into the air to go wherever they may go. Also, yeah. have a beauty. So that's, yeah. Um, the song is, I got no roots because my home has never been on the ground. Uh, and I forget who sings that. I've got no roots because my home has never been on the ground. Um, that's mm, beautiful. It's a, it's, she is great as well, this singer, because she, I feel like your, your people listening are like, I know who she's talking about. <laughs> because I know that she used to be a teacher. This that she's she has um she has like phenomenally grown um this singer and Maybe it'll come to me if we have a couple more minutes and I'll just be thinking about it. It gives me a little space to think on that. Well, I talk about the California redwoods. Those are massive trees. And I just learned this not long ago. But when you think about a tree that massive, you would think that their roots would come out the other side of the earth. They have to be so big. But they don't. They are hardly underground at all. They interconnect. The roots with one redwood interconnect with other redwoods and they hold each other up. And I think it's one of the most beautiful concepts that is found in nature that you're not going to find a redwood all by itself. 
because I can't stand. But you get redwoods together, they hold each other up. Oh, that is a beautiful concept and metaphor and a miracle of nature. Oh, yeah, I can preach on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That'll preach. Um, B, as we close our time together here, if at any time you remember the fingers name, just blurt it out. Just blurt it out. Um, but what other thoughts would you like to have us to have us ponder as we close today? Think about what you are paying attention to. Like, what are you paying attention to? Is it adding to your to your life, to your love, to your laughter? You know, your attitude. So your attention, where your attention goes, where your attitude goes. And what is your intent? What is it you would like to accomplish? Today, this hour, make it as big or as large as you need it to be. And then put the steps in place to, to make it uh, a reality. But I'd say attention, attitude, and intent. And if you concentrate on those three then you can get yourself from here to there, from here to there, and just keep moving step by step. Attention, attitude, and, and intent. I love that. Uh, everybody needs to forget that immediately because I'm going to be using that in a sermon. And so just forget you heard it here, but I will give you credit. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And friends, make sure you click the link in the show notes and check out her book, Girl, You Ain't Crazy. It is so worth the read. You'll enjoy every minute of it and you'll want to follow B and just find out everything she does and says because she is a jewel and one you'll want to know. So click on that link and buy her book and then share it with someone else. Oh, that sounds amazing. Do you have, um, do you get messages on your, on your channel? Well, let's just say there's the capability to get messages on the, on the platform. So, so, so if someone knows the singer that I have been mentioning in this podcast, please leave us that note in that, in her note so she can share it oh. with me. <laughs> Go to pursuinguncomfortable.com and in the uh, episode, you can comment on the blog that accompanies the episode. You can comment or on the YouTube channel at, at Melissa Evkin. Uh, you'll see the video there. Feel free to comment there, too. And let's get this name out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, B. Oh, thank you, Mel. Like I said, for having me, for having this conversation because it's such an important conversation to have.